have the pleasure of being here today to chat with Gretchen Rubin, the author of her new book, Better Than Before, Mastering the Habits of Our Everyday Lives. So Gretchen, thanks for being here. Um, my first question is, what drove you to write this book? Well, f you know, I wrote The Happiness Project and Happier at Home, so for years I'd been researching and writing and talking to people about happiness. And I began to notice a pattern that was when I was talking to people about some big happiness boost that they'd achieved, or more often, a big happiness challenge that they were facing, very often they were pointing to something that at its core involved a habit. Like somebody would say, oh, I'm just exhausted all the time, and that's, that's what's dragging me down, which is really about the habit of getting enough sleep. And so I became increasingly interested in the role that habits play um, in a happier, healthier, more productive life. And also the question is, like, how can we change our habits? Because sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. So what was going on there? Right. And you emphasize that an important step in changing our habits is knowing yourself. Yeah. Why is that? Well, this, you know, there's so much of a desire for a one-size-fits-all solution. You know, do it first thing in the morning, start small, do it for 30 days, have a cheat day, you know. But there is no magic one-size-fits-all solution. And what I found when I looked at it is that really all of us have to think about what's true for us. Um, even something as simple as are you a morning person or, or a night person? If you're a night person getting up early to go for a run, you're not setting yourself up for success. That's probably not going to work for you. But often people, they just decide what they think their, their habits should be or they look at what Benjamin Franklin did or what their brother-in-law did and try to copy it. But in fact, what you have to do is to really say, well, what's true about me? What do I notice about myself? What's my nature? So that you shape the habit to suit yourself and then you set yourself up for success. Awesome. Um, now, I suspect that I, like many others, want to improve my eating habits, oh, yeah. but boy, that is a hard thing to do. Are there any habit-changing techniques that you would suggest to me and others who want to eat a little better? Well, one thing um, is the strategy of abstaining. And again, this is a strategy where you have to know yourself because it works really well for some people, like me, and doesn't work at all for other people. So abstainers are people who do better when they give up something altogether. Like, I can eat no Thin Mints, or I can eat 10 Thin Mints, but I can't eat two Thin Mints. I'm an abstainer, so for me, resisting temptation altogether. So if French fries are your kryptonite, whatever it is, just give it up altogether, and that's easier for you. It sounds harder, but it's actually easier. Then moderators do better when they have something sometimes, or they have a little bit, and often if they, if they know they can have something, they don't even want it. And so they do better when they do have a little bit that they allow themselves. And this is true for, for food, but also for things like technology. You know, if you, can't, if you can't play a little Candy Crush, maybe you want to play no Candy Crush. But abstaining is a strategy that when you know yourself, it can be enormously powerful, uh, but it may not work for you. So you really have to know um, what kind of person you are. So w is someone um, an abstainer across all of their domains, or you know, might I, should I maybe abstain in some things but try moderating in others? No, almost everybody's a mix. It really has to do with how you deal with a strong temptation. So like for, for chocolate, I'm an abstainer, but for wine, I can drink half a glass of wine. And some people are like, I can have no wine, or I can have four glasses of wine, I can't have one glass of wine. So you, it has to do with managing a strong temptation. Um, but like moderators, this is a mystery to me. Uh, moderators often keep a, s a bar of fine chocolate squirreled away somewhere in their desk, and every day they'll have one square of fine chocolate. As an abstainer, there's no way I would not eat that chocolate bar in one day. It would just haunt me until I'd eaten it. Um, but for a moderator, that's what works. Yeah, I agree with you. There's no way that chocolate bar right? would last more than an <laughs> yeah, hour. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure that over the course of working on this book, you've spoken to a bunch of different people about a bunch of different habits they would like to implement in their life. What are some of the things that people are looking to change yeah. in their lives? Well, almost everything falls into what I call the essential seven. Um, and I don't know if I can come up with all seven of them. Mm -hmm. I always forget one, but it's eating and drinking more healthfully, exercising more, engaging more deeply with relationships, with nature, with God, um, saving, spending, and uh, earning money wisely, um, simplifying, clearing, uncluttering, organizing, uh, making more progress, and also stop procrastinating. Those are two sides of the same coin. 
Um, and I'm leaving one out, but there's another. Oh, oh, and rest, relax, and enjoy, which is things like this sort of something you're very interested in, which is how do people experience the moment? How do they have leisure? How can they rest? A lot of people feel like they're just never at rest. So there are these seven areas, and just about every habit that people come up with somehow fits into one of these areas. Interesting. Um, so you mentioned in the context of eating more healthfully that there are these strategies of abstaining yeah. versus moderating. Um, across th those different um, changes that people are looking to make in their life, what are um, some other strategies that seem to produce the best results? So what I found when I was looking at how people master their habits is that there are 21 strategies that people use. And that can sometimes that sounds terrifying to people because it's so many, but it's good because you can just pick and choose what works for you. And, um, and not all the strategies are available to us at all times, and they don't all work for everyone. Um, so there are many strategies. One of the most um, helpful strategies uh, and most familiar strategies is like the strategy of monitoring, which is that if we monitor something, we tend to do a better job. So if you want to eat more healthfully, you keep a food journal. If you want to exercise more, you use a step counter. Another one is accountability. Most people do better when someone's holding them accountable. So the strategy of accountability. And for some people, it's essential. It's like the critical piece of allowing them to meet their, uh, change their habits. Um, the strategy of scheduling. Put something on your schedule and it's more likely to get done. Um, one that I took from for granted, it seems so obvious to me, but many people have really loved it, is the strategy of pairing. When you pair something that you like to do with a habit that you perhaps don't enjoy as much. So very often people will pair going, going on the treadmill or the stationary bike with watching television. Because then if they can only watch Game of Thrones when they're on the treadmill, then they're suddenly much more excited about going on the treadmill. Or maybe you're cleaning in the morning and you're listening to podcasts. I, start, I just started a podcast with my sister, um, Happier with Gretchen Rubin, and a lot of people have said, like, oh, I'm, I'm pairing that with something else that I don't like to do. Um, but there's 20, one of my, my, the one that I think is the funniest strategy is loophole squatting because we're such advocates for ourselves. We can come up with so many justifications for why we should be off the hook. Just this once, just right now. Oh, oh, I forgot. There's an excuse. I don't have to do this right now. I forgot. It's my birthday. I'm on vacation. You only live once. I have to take advantage of this or lose out forever. We're so, uh, we're so ingenious in coming up with, uh, with strategies of, uh, of justification. <laughs> Let's just explore it. Yeah. Um, well, they seem very helpful. Um, now, you say that through implementing good habits, it takes the thought out of behavior, so we're not constantly saddled yeah. with these choices where we have to exert self-control. Now, one of my qu and so I guess the question that I have is, if the goal is to make so much of our life mindless, does that potentially come at the cost of mindfulness? And maybe we start stop noticing, you know, the joys in life or savoring the joys or so I was thinking, for instance, if I implement the habit of every morning as my husband and I are sort of saying goodbye on our way to work, we give each other a kiss and we say, I love you. That's fun. What happens? <laughs> Does that lose its meaning if it becomes a habit? And similarly, if every Saturday morning um, my family, we sit down for pancake breakfast, does it lose its specialness if it's now a habit? Well, that's a super important question because habits are, are freeing and energizing because they eliminate decision and self-control, but they often also have downsides. Now, with the examples that you give, um, I immediately thought of this wonderful quotation from by Flannery O'Connor when somebody said, well, because she was a very devout Catholic, and somebody said, well, but if you're just going through these, these Catholic rituals by habit, don't they lose their meaning? And she said, the church is mighty realistic about human nature. It's better to be held to the church by habit than not at all. And sometimes if you don't have the habit of kissing every morning, you just forget to do it. So part of it is that habit does make, does help us ensure that things that are really important to us actually get done. So in that way, I think there's still something to be said for putting it on automatic. But you're absolutely right. Habits speed time. If you, you know, the first month on a job feels like it takes forever, but then the fifth year on the job goes in a flash because as, every, as things become more familiar, the brain just speeds through them and to do something novel and challenging slows time. Most of us enjoy experiencing slow, rich time. So that's a negative of habit. And the other thing is, as you say, they deaden. They deaden experience. Now sometimes that can be good. Like if you're doing something that makes you anxious and you do it over and over until it becomes a habit, that'll deaden that, those negative feelings. But also if you're kissing every morning, maybe you're not gonna experience it. It's gonna deaden your feelings. Or like you know, the first couple times you had that morning cup of coffee, it was bliss. 
But now that you have it every day, you don't even taste it. You're frantic if you don't get it, but you don't even taste it. So you're absolutely right. Habits, in some ways, they're wonderful. And of course, I'm kind of a habits pusher. I'm a big advocate for the power of habits. But on the other hand, they really do have downsides. So you're exactly right. We want to be mindful about how we use mindlessness because you don't want your whole life just, you don't want to just be a bureaucrat of your own paperwork in your life. Right. Interesting. Um, so as an upholder, I love <laughs> your advice around scheduling. Um, and not to mention it's a nicely captured from my own research on happiness where shifting people's attention towards time leads them to behave in ways that are more fulfilling and make them happier. Um, and you made a really nice point that scheduling is a strategy that makes sure that you'll spend time on things that are most important to you. And I was just sort of wondering, how do you manage your schedule? Do you um, have a paper planner that you write things down? Is it in Outlook? Is it in your head? Yeah. And also, not only how do you maintain your schedule, but what are those things that you ensure are in your day-to-day -day that you are sure to schedule in? Well, I use ye old file of facts. I'm one of the old, <laughs> like, you know, the <laughs> same one I've had for a very long time. Um, and, then, and then I have certain sort of rules that I follow. So if, for instance, if I'm writing a book, then I try to do three hours of original writing in a day, which doesn't sound like that much, maybe, unless you've written a book, and then it sounds like a lot. Um, and so, uh, so in a day-to-day, -day, I use a paper calendar to help schedule what I need to and then put in exercise and you know, fit that in uh, in between the, the appointments. I wish my days could unfold very regularly, but they don't. I have a very irregular schedule. It kind of drives me crazy. But one of the things that I found is that sometimes you feel like these very high, high transcendent values can't be monitored or can't be scheduled, like quality time with your family or reading for fun. And what I found is that if I put it on my calendar, I'm much more likely to stick to it. And I actually need to sometimes put that in. And so, for instance, when my older daughter be that became a teenager and I wasn't spending as much time with her, I wanted to have special time, just the two of us, where we weren't talking about homework or, you know, there was no nagging or chores or errands involved. And so we set aside an afternoon a week so that we would have that time together. So I just made sure that there was a place on my calendar for it. And then it was such a relief because I didn't worry, like, oh, I'm not spending any time with her, because I was. And so that was, and, and same thing, like I love to read, and, uh, and yet I feel like I don't have enough time to read, and so I actually have, on the weekends, like I set aside time for different kinds of reading to make sure that I have the time that I want. I love that idea. I need to <laughs> become more deliberate with my schedule. Um, now, another question I had was, again, as an upholder, I feel like I should fairly easily be able to implement wonderfully positive habits around eating, exercise, and sleep. However, <laughs> between my demanding career and also trying to cultivate my loving relationship with my husband, my son, let alone my family yeah. and friends, I sort of feel like I have little control over how I spend my time and I feel like I'm more reactive rather than proactive with respect to what I eat and when I sleep, yeah. I mean, exercise yeah. is a thing of the past, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately. So I'm just sort of wondering, what advice do you have for me as well as others who feel like they are, you know, trying to create positive habits for myself, but I'm very much living in the context of others? Well, that's, I mean, so many people face that problem. Um, and there's one strategy that's called the strategy of foundation. And it has to do with the strat, like if you're going to start somewhere, if you wanted to make your life work better, you wanted to strengthen your habits, these are the habits that you would want to work on first because they're going to make all self-mastery easier. But like you say, it's many of the ones you listed. It's eating and drinking, like making sure that you're eating enough. Just paradoxically, one reason that people overeat is that they don't eat enough and then they get too hungry and then they just eat all the wrong foods because they don't have any self-mastery. Uh, drinking lowers your inhibitions. Getting enough sleep. If you're not getting enough sleep, you're drained. It's very hard to use your good habits. Um, exercise, maybe not going to the gym or training for the marathon, but just like going for a 15, 20 minute walk. That makes people feel more energetic, more in touch command. And strangely, uncluttering. For a lot of people, getting outer order makes them feel more in control of themselves. Even if it's an illusion, it's sort of a helpful illusion. And so those are the areas to start with. But so those are the areas you're struggling with. And, you know, I, I would say first start with getting enough sleep. And for many people, they don't want to give up that last couple of hours because that's sort of their playtime, their goof-off time, their fun time. 
but it's really important to get enough sleep. And so for a lot of people, I think it's helpful even to set an alarm, just like you have an alarm in the morning, have an alarm at night. Figure out, most adults need seven hours. Figure out what your bedtime is. A lot of adults don't even really have a bedtime. You know, little kids have a bedtime, but we just, oh, I'll go to bed when I'm tired. And then at the last minute, you know, you check your work email or you start watching something on TV and second wind, I'm not tired at all, I'll stay up. Um, and But you should have gone to bed, you know, hours before. Yeah. So starting with getting enough sleep. And I have to say for myself, this doesn't work for everybody, but if you give up sugar, if you're trying to eat more healthfully, if you give up sugar, you get out of a lot of cravings and there's a lot of stuff that just falls off the list of, thi of temptations. But again, I say that as an abstainer, a pretty yeah. hardcore abstainer, <laughs> so it's not for everyone, right. but it's something to think about. So I guess it uh, sort of um, part of my question, or I guess the crux of it was um, creating those habits and so following those rules in the context of, um, you know, coordinating with my husband and son. So it's easy enough for me to set an alarm at, you know, nine o'clock. I would love to start going to bed at nine o'clock every night. Oh, um, you have to do it every night. Well, I'm starting to try, okay. but then there's the question of like, well, my husband doesn't want to go to bed at nine o'clock at night, and then are we going to bed at different times, and maybe that's okay, but then there's like him waking me up when he goes to bed, and then me waking up earlier in the morning, and um, and similarly coming up with what I want to eat for dinner, or, you know, to be healthy, do I impose that uh -huh. when we're sort of getting, ta you know, dinner on the table for my son and myself, right. so sort of creating habits that I don't want to impose you know, right. the things that I want to do for myself yeah. onto others. Um, yeah. But I, s you know, how do you sort of coordinate? Well, it's, it's I mean, and this is the strategy of other people, which is that sometimes it's easy to talk about our habits as if we were just this isolated unit going through. But as you point out, quite rightly, we're, we're in a context of other people. And also, our habits rub off on them, and their habits are rubbing off on, you might go to bed at 9 o'clock, except your husband goes to bed at midnight, right? So he's pulling you later, and maybe you're pulling him earlier, but so your habits are inter in interacting with each other. Um, and so it's very important to think that through and to say like, well, what do I want to be true for me? Um, and uh, often one loophole, I'm not saying that you're invoking <laughs> a loophole, but I'm I just saying very it's a well very popular, a, a very popular <laughs> loophole is the concern for others loophole. Others will be uncomfortable if I don't have a drink at this business dinner. Um, it's a birthday, if you're having a birthday party, I have to have a piece of your birthday cake or it's gonna hurt your feelings. Really, is it going to, do you, do you, like how much, like part of it is to really look very closely at, at what do people care about or what is gonna negatively affect someone or how is it, can you make a different decision for yourself from what other, what other people choose? Um, because I think sometimes there's this sort of this assumption like, well, I can't, uh, I can't force everybody to eat the way I do. Does everybody have to eat the way you do? Can you eat differently from them? Can they eat more like you? I mean, I, I think it's back to this idea of mindfully that you raised a while ago. That sometimes I think we skate over these questions too quickly and we don't focus in on like, well, what, what, what would I like to do? And what can they do and what would they do? And do we have to do the same thing? Um, but I just had a funny example of this where uh, every year my uh, in-laws and my family go away on a beach vacation together. But this year I was on my book tour so I couldn't go. And three days after into it, my husband texted me, you're not here, everything's starting an hour and a half later. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm an early riser and I like right. to eat early. And it's not that I'm shaking people awake, but when I'm up and around, it kind of everybody else sort of gets up and around. And when I'm saying like, I think I'm, I'm starting to get hungry, everybody else is like, well, okay. You know, so we do have this, this, this uh, engagement, um, but if you're very clear about what you want and what's right for you and what you want your life to look like, well, a lot of times if you change, others will change, um, even if you're not trying to change them. But it's not easy. I don't want to make it sound like it's just all you do is make up your mind because it is very hard when you're working with other people. And the more people, the more complicated it gets. But I think it's something that's really worth thinking about instead of just sort of assuming like, well, I can't, I can't go to bed earlier. Right. You know, well, well maybe you could. Just yeah. think about it. There might be ways. And it sounds like not only just think about it, but discuss with those around you yeah, who yeah, yeah. Um, you're Bec trying to coordinate with. No, because often they might have a similar, l like one thing that I work on a lot, because just because I myself love to clean people's closets, it's like a hobby of mine. And what I've noticed is that often, like I'll go over to a friend's house and we'll clean out a closet. And then my friend's husband will get so exhilarated by seeing that clean closet that he'll clean out his closet. So sometimes if you 
if you do something and it's really working for you, if you got a lot more sleep and you were just feeling so much better, your husband might be like, man, I need to start turning off the TV a little bit myself. Like, what am I doing? You know, it's it, like, why are we, what are we doing from 11 to midnight? It's not a high quality time. Maybe we'd rather have that time in the morning. Maybe we'd rather have that sleep. Um, so if, uh, what would you most like people to take away from reading? That there is no one size fits all solution. You know, we are constantly told, like, if only you would do it this way or try this, this is the magic solution. And there really, every, some things work for some people sometimes, but nothing works for everybody all the time. A lot of things that work very well for some people actually are counterproductive for some. Um, so you really have to think about yourself. Um, even things as simple as, are you a morning person or a night person? Um, and when you think about yourself, then you can shape the habit to suit you. And that's what allows people to succeed. I think they'd get dis we get discouraged because we try and fail, but often we haven't set ourselves up for success because we haven't shaped it in a way that's going to be in harmony with our nature, our values, our interests. And when we do that, then there's a lot more that we can do that's going to allow us to succeed. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for writing such a wonderful book and oh. for spending this time um, with me today to tell me more. Well, thank you for giving me this <laughs> chance to talk about habits.